So I, I want to talk about a couple of things there too. I want to talk about the drugs a little bit, mm -hmm. and I want to talk about the um, the sound and how it got developed at 1270 and elsewhere in the city. Now, who was the first sound person that actually came in there and said that this could be better? Was that Lou Feldman that, uh, Feldman that started that? No, I don't think it was Lou Feldman. I can't remember the person's name at the 1270. Okay. But Lou Feldman came in after that person and changed everything. Yeah, for the better. For the better. Yeah. And Lou Feldman was my roommate for three years. Okay. He was colorblind. Uh -huh. He only wore white t-shirts, white tennis shoes, and jeans. Uh -huh. His closet was just white t-shirts, tennis shoes, and jeans. So he, and he actually brought a mixer in there. Yes. And Lou Feldman used to be the chief sound engineer for WBCN okay. when BCN was at the Prudential Tower. Okay. And he and I used to do simulcast from Paul's Mall to WBCN. Oh yeah. What's yeah. Paul's Mall? That's where the Buddies opened. Okay, was that so? It was a bar um, called Paul's, Paul's Mall before it was. It buddies. was it was a jazz bar, yeah. Okay, underneath where the um, half shell <clears> is. We haven't talked about buddies a lot with anybody yet either. That's something yeah. I keep forgetting because I don't really know who the DJs were during that. I period. opened buddies. You helped open buddies. I had the the job for <clears> buddies <throat> nine months before the the club opened, okay. and um, I wanted Lou Feldman to be my sound engineer. I wanted Lou Feldman sound system in there, and instead they had Nigel Earthworm. That's his real name. Yeah. Um, do the sound engineering and set up. And um, all I can say is, opening night, um, it was. I was there at seven o'clock, and um, eight o'clock, the sound system was still not working. Working. What year was this? About. I don't remember the exact year, but I already had a home in my house, and my house I bought it in 76. So I believe it was probably 78, 79. Okay. So, this, so before Buddies, was most of the action for you at the 1270? Was that really The where 1270. I started playing records where <coughs> the La House of Blues is now. It, um, it used to be a place called um, the... Um, I can't remember right now. Not cabaret. No, it was, I was I started working at cabaret, but before that it was called. It was like a hippie place where they had concerts. Um, oh, the tea party. The tea party. Right. Right. And they closed the tea party, and then Eddie Katina, with someone else, opened cabaret. And that's where I started playing. So your first public playing was at cabaret. At cabaret. And then, at the time, 1270 was had already started with Jimmy. Right. So this was all happening kind of at the same time. At the same, same time, time, right. Um, and both places were very busy. I mean. Very busy. Cabaret was very busy. <laughs> the DJ booth was up on the um, skylight. <coughs> it was a big steel ball, and the DJ booth was there, and I had a Tascan mixer, and there were four towers of, mi of speakers around the room. And the DJ booth was up there, and there was a ladder that we had to pull down and then climb up with all our records, and then the ladder would pull back up. Are you still using 45s at this point, or are 12 inches starting to become? 45s. Yeah, so 12 inches don't come along for a little bit No, longer. 12 inches didn't come in until, I think, 1975 or something like that. Right, okay. Yeah. So is that where you met Val as a cabaret, or did you know Val before that? I think I met Val at one of the record stores at, I really don't remember when I met Val. All I know is we were, we all knew who we were, mm -hmm. but we weren't really close. Right. We were, we were aware of each other, but at the time we were all ourselves right. and not really close. But all sharing one, an interest in DJing. Exactly. Right. The closest person I was with was Jimmy Stewart. Now, can you explain how Danai fits into all of this? Because I know some people say that Danai was doing this in Provincetown. Yes. And that he was actually kind of influential as well because he was doing things in Provincetown that people right. here weren't doing yet either. Right. Well, what happened with Danai, um, I met Danai at the A House in Provincetown. I don't remember what year. But I was at the A House, and uh, this jockey was sitting on a table with the turntables going, and the next thing you know, 
the disc jockey just falls over on the floor. And uh, obviously he was drugged out. And Dane I was there, and I remember him, like close my eyes, with long blonde hair, dressed beautiful like a woman, and he just went and pushed the guy out of the side and started playing <coughs> records. And that's how I met Dane I. And that's how he got his start. That's how he <coughs> got his start. And after that, he just kept doing it and doing it. And I moved to Boston, and then he came to Boston. But we knew, who, there again, we knew who we were, but we weren't really close. Right. Yes. So you get, so he, so he comes to Boston, and he moves in with... Who was he living with at the time? He was living with Val? No. He was, I don't remember, I didn't pay attention to so those really things. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's not that I didn't care, it's just I didn't pay attention <coughs> to those things. Right. I was too busy trying to maintain myself and <laughs> right. trying to do a good job. Um, and also at the time I went to college, I went to a Chamberlain Junior College, I was going to be an executive bilingual secretary. Mm -hmm. And that's during the time that I gave that up. To continue to DJ instead. You did, so you yeah. actually gave up that to go to yeah. become a DJ. Oh yeah, I used to work for Warner Brother Films uh, at the time at the office, and I was kept waiting to have somebody discover me in behind the desk. So Warner Brothers had a Boston office. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, well, I used to work in the office, picked up the mail, and I had to call the theaters every day to find out the gross of the movies. Right, right. Yeah. okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm trying to get a sense of the timeline here. So we went from the other side to 1270, mm -hmm. Cabaret. Buddies is a little bit later. Well, it's Cabaret. Right. And the other side, Cabaret, 1270 and Cabaret fall together. Yeah. And then Buddies, uh, then it was Randolph Country Club. Yeah, now we haven't talked about Randolph Country Club much. Why? What made Randolph Country Club so noteworthy because it's on the South Shore, so it's kind of pretty far outside the city. Well, it was out of the city, it had a pool, it mm -hmm. was different, it was owned by gay people, and uh, it was just like going out of town to go someplace different. So it was owned by gay people, which also made it different, right? right. Because most of the bars in the city were owned by the mob, basically. The mob, yeah. yeah. And I used to work at the uh, Randolph Country Club, and Jack Rubin was the manager of the Randolph Country Club, and he's the one that started Buddies. And he said to me, Conrad, you're going to work at Buddies. And I opened Buddies. And I said, I don't want the sound system in the DJ booth. I want uh, Lou Feldman to do the music, I mean the sound, and um, certain things are, that were expected of them that they promised, and none of them they did. Mm -hmm. The sound system was in the DJ booth. It was hot as hell. People would smoke in the building. Um, I never smoked cigarettes. Um, also, I wanted an air conditioner in the DJ booth. All they had was a little vent. I used to sweat to death, but I did get three turntables, which was the first. Yeah. 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 So how long were you at? So you said you were at Buddy's for what nine months before it opened? Mm, I w I had the job at Buddy's nine months before it opened. Yeah. And then I worked for Buddy's for about eight months. Yeah. And the reason I got fired was because I threw the owners out of the DJ booth. Yeah. They had a problem with sound, with the half shell on top. Yeah. And um, there were nine owners. And one of them was a manager, was Jack Rubin. And Jack Rubin used to tend to drink. And um, the DJ booth was a cab of a truck. And mm -hmm. the turntables were right here and there was the window. So they would come and say, turn the music down, it's too loud from the window. They would come and turn the music up, it's too low. Uh, and it was just constant, constant, constant. And one day I just said, forget it. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't take this anymore. Mm -hmm. Just leave me alone. Mm -hmm. And that was the last day because they also had other people waiting to come in. And one of them was Paul Egan. All right. Yeah. So there was a lot of, comp was there, so competition was starting to develop amongst the DJs for jobs in the city, would you say? Well, it's like high school to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm better than you are, you're better than me, I got this record before you and you got the other record before me. Yeah. Um, I never considered it a competition, I considered it just a development. Yeah. You know, um, but going back to sound engineering, um, Lou Fellman was a, a big um, 
how do you say, uh, Colton, how do you say, Fulcrum? Or it was just a big thing for me to get in more involved in the sound systems mm -hmm. and into the nightclub business. And, you know, then right. it was just unbelievable. So when did this? So when did Chaps sort of become a go, an, a going sort of concern? Well, Chaps was never a dance bar, right? Chaps was um, just a beer bar with right. with um, peanut shells on the floor, and that's what it was. And then next to it, they opened a club called um, Sticks. S no, not Sticks. It was um, what was a different name for it? I can't remember. But Dennis Fisher used to work there, and he worked there mainly because he was um, part of the new, um, I can't remember the other guy's name that owned the place. Um, but Dennis Fisher was a DJ? Yes, Dennis Fisher used to DJ there. Is he still with us? Or? No, he's been far gone. Okay. And he used to, we were always involved in the mix, but he used to not mix, he would just put the needle on the record and just let it go. Mm -hmm. So we nicknamed, nicknamed him Prunasonic de la Clatza. <laughs> we all gave names to each other. Even though we were your competitors and, yeah. and your rivals, we yeah. were still, uh, how do you say it? We, were, we knew we were in the same, <coughs> in the same we business. Fraternity of sorts. Yeah. So we, <coughs> had, we had that going for us and we always we're friendly with, with each other, and now even more so in Facebook, which is really great. Right. That's yeah. where a lot of people have reconnected. Sure. Right. That's, right. I think, how a lot of this project has started to come right. about, because we well connected to each other through that. Right. But it was Chaps, and let's say Sticks, because I, there was a name before that. Yeah. Um, and then Sticks used to be packed every Sunday, mm -hmm. and uh, people would go back and forth to Chaps and Sticks, Chaps and Sticks, and then they opened the uh, darts on Dartmouth Street mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden everybody went to darts and I used to work at Sticks at the time and um, nobody would come to the bar and stay they come in and look and then they would leave if they stayed people would be there so then when people would come they go to see nobody they say well there's nobody there so they would all go to darts and that's when darts uh, when Sticks broke down the wall between chaps and became one big dance club.